Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Jill, Jill Harkavy Friedman. I'm the Vice President of Research at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And we're so glad to be with you today. And today we have an amazing uh, person who's joining us to talk about mental health among minorities, particularly black youth. And she is the Chief of Psychiatry at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Tammy Benton. Tammy, welcome. Thank you, Jill. I'm so pleased to be here. You know, we're so happy to have you here. You have an incredible depth of experience and knowledge, and we welcome everyone to share questions with us. And uh, Dr. Benton and I will be uh, happy to answer them. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best. And um, But I do want to, maybe you could start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your work and how come this conversation is important. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Jill. So I, I actually, um, I'm the psychiatrist in chief at the Children's Hospital Philadelphia. Um, and my work is principally focused on treating young people um, with mood disorders, with primarily with depression, and bipolar disorder. Um, you know, I treat a lot of young people who um, experience suicidal ideation. And, you know, when I started my work, um, I was much more focused on um, working with children um, who have medical and mental health conditions. And that's very much related to my training and trained as a pediatrician, adult and child psychiatrist. And my area of ex expertise focus during training and, and sometime after that really was focused on psychosomatic medicine or medicine for individuals who also have medical illnesses. So I started off working with um, populations that are principally impacted by sickle cell disease um, which is primarily black populations um, and Mediterranean individuals. And then um, I did a lot of work with HIV. Um, and you know what I started to learn is I started to work with more children with, um, with, with HIV specifically, there seemed to be much higher rates of depression in those populations. And so, um, and so my career developed more into a focus on um, depression. And certainly, you know, not everyone who has depression ever becomes suicidal, but certainly there are subpopulations of depressed individuals who do become suicidal. And so, um, so then my career much more evolved in that direction. But um, I also started to observe though, um, contrary to what um, I believed when I was going through my training, that African-American people did not commit suicide. And, um, you know, and then African American people didn't seek mental health treatment either. You know, we just soldiered through, and those things didn't happen. And of course, you know, as I practiced more, I realized that those were myths, and that those things were not true, um, and that you know, the bigger issues really had to do with under identification of those who were at risk, and um, stigma, um, mistrust of mental health systems and health systems broadly that influenced. Um, influence recognition and access to treatment. And so now, um, you know, I'm very lucky that I work in a, a urban city that has a, a large diverse population, but I'm also very lucky that I have a large diverse group of faculty members and staff who can provide care for diverse populations. And so it's, you know, it's allowed us to um, have more conversations, to see more patients. Um, and then, you know, my, in addition to uh, my clinical work, my research has started to focus increasingly on how suicide impacts um, minoritized populations and particularly black youth. So, you know, interestingly, um, we, we seem to not have noticed or not really talked about the fact that the rates of suicide were increasing among black youth. And so traditionally, you know, we, we look at all of our, you know, um, our, our, diagrams from the Centers for Disease Control, we mostly see, um, you know, the, the curves for increasing suicide for um, white populations, principally, and then everybody else is really low. Um, and, and then for younger kids under 11, uh, under 12, it actually looked like nothing had changed for years, so that we were under the impression that the rates really weren't increasing very much for minoritized populations. And then over the last maybe five years, since about 2015, 16, um, 
we started to take a deeper dive into some of the trends that we were observing related to suicide specifically and started to notice when we looked at the data for children between the ages of five and 11, that the rates of suicide for black boys between the ages of five and 11 was increasing very, very rapidly. And so we started to, um, we've started to focus more on this particular phenomenon. And, you know, and some of that focus has been driven by the recognition that the suicide rates, you know, for black youth have been increasing, you know, for more than 40, 50 years. Okay. And, um, we just sort of didn't really notice. Um, but then the dramatic changes that started to happen with the black boys under 12 really caught the attention of, um, Senator Bonnie Watson Coleman, who actually convened the emergency task force on black youth suicide and mental health. And that has really highlighted and brought attention to this, to this issue. And so, you know, my, my work at this juncture, you know, I, I oversee a mood disorder suicide prevention program for children and adolescents. Um, and, you know, we're starting to focus more on trying to understand, um, you know, what's happening that the rates are increasing. So that's a little bit of that. I know it's hard to sum up all the amazing work that you've done, but I also want to add to that, that you are on the scientific council of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which helps to spread the impact of your work, because that's part of what we do, is bring things, not just, you know, bring it out publicly, but also to communities around the country. So, um, Thank you for all your amazing work. And it's interesting because it, you started that in a time when people, like you said, thought that black kids didn't, anybody black didn't actually die by suicide, that it wasn't a phenomenon. Um, we know enough about suicide to know that it cuts across all groups, all ages. Different ages are and groups are at different risk levels. Um, and But it, I think it strikes the importance of if you hear someone talking about suicide, talking about not wanting to be around anymore, talking about uh, wanting to end their life, that, um, sorry, that um, you have to take it seriously. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know what, I, and to your comments about the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, I, I just wanna emphasize how important your organization has been in raising awareness about these issues and how important your organization has been for me as a professional in helping me um, recognize and implement an agenda around suicide prevention. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention was foundational for the work that we do now. So I may not have shared that with you previously. <laughs> no, well, thank you for sharing that because it, yeah. it helps to know. And, and we are, you know, grassroots. So we are, anybody can volunteer with us and participate with us and engage in suicide prevention or get information if you are struggling or you've lost someone to suicide. And we will share some links to places on our websites and other places where you can connect and find out more information about um, your own experience or how to help somebody else. So um, I guess, you know, are the, they're going to ask like a kind of complicated question. Are the difficulty, the, the rising rate, and you mentioned that they, there's a mistrust of mental health care. Is that because there's a basic mistrust or because the system is not as available to people from minority populations as it is to white people? I mean, I know that you, can, you don't have the actual answer to that. But what do you think about that? Is it systemic or is it something unique about being a minority person? Um, so I, I think it's it's both. So I think it's I think there are definitely systemic issues that make mental health access challenging for everyone. Um, and it's it's hard if you particularly if you have limited resources, um, if you have to use your insurance to pay for mental health care, because, you know, unfortunately, as we recognize, a lot of mental health treatment services are private and that people are asking that you pay. So it's an expense. Um, and then even if you can pay, um, you know, or if you have insurance that provides, gives you access to clinicians, you know, there's, there's not enough professionals um, and they're long waits. So it's very difficult for people to get access to appointments. And then the biggest, the biggest struggle I have as a professional is I believe very strongly that people should be able to get care when they need it. 
And inevitably with mental health care, there's a wait. And, you know, many times you can't wait. You know, sometimes you can, uh, many times you can't wait. And so I think that's particularly challenging. Um, there's certainly, if you have fairly significant mental health challenges and you need a child psychiatrist, it's even harder um, because the numbers are limited. But we, we have increased our focus on trying to teach more people um, to provide basic mental health care, which really should be part of whole person care. So, you know, general practitioners, um, you know, many, most of whom actually provide some mental health care for, um, for folks should be, that should be routine practice. And so, you know, expanding access to mental health care is gonna be really important. For, for minoritized populations, um, you know, there's a history of um, disparities in care. So, you know, there's systemic racism has definitely played a role in, um, you know, creating situations where it's not comfortable to seek care and there's a lack of trust. Okay? And that's based on real experiences. Um, but I wish I could say it was based on one real experience. It's actually based on multiple real experiences that still exist. And so I think that's, you know, I think that's one challenge. The other is the stigma. Yeah. So um, let's take a, I mean, I think what you're saying is so important, but it also, I hope, motivates all of us to be more proactive and to have a voice in our mental health and medical health care, to push that envelope. And um, even though it's hard when you're in a position of not feeling well, garner your resources, bring people together, and um, really push the system to provide the care that's needed. So let's take a question from our audience. Um, the question is, are current events a trigger of, for minority populations these days? I can imagine there's a lot of fear and hopelessness. So uh, current events, um, which ones? Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I think that's part of the issue. Yeah, we've we've had a you know what we call a syndemic, right? So it's it's been the pandemic of um, COVID nineteen, which has really adversely impacted all of us and had disproportionate impact on minoritized communities, on Black communities, Latinx communities. Um, we've experienced more losses, um, so COVID has really hit us hard, and the disparities. Um, have contributed to that, and and it's you can't not see them now. So even if you, you know, somehow spent your life thinking that disparities for African Americans didn't exist, um, you it's hard to ignore now. So we we've lost a lot for kids. They, kids, teenagers, some of them for the first time ever have lost relatives who were healthy, from their perspective. People who were not ill. They never had a chance to say goodbye to them. They never had a chance to grieve the losses. And that's impacting people now. You know, separations from people they were close to. So I, I think all those things have disproportionately impacted Black populations. And the loss of employment and income and all the other things that impacted, you know, socioeconomically distressed communities before, you know, were they're disproportionate for us. So those things happen. Um, I think the other piece that is really important that we all experienced is the, you know, watching the murder of George Floyd. And, um, you know, it, it, it has had a very empowering um, impact in some ways, but it also stirs up a lot of things because, you know, the, the first thing that I think many of us said is, you know what, like, this is not the first time this happens. This, this happens often. Um, and as much as it, it's been an opportunity to embrace the partnerships with everyone in our country, it definitely does stir up some emotions and feelings around what has been historical, longstanding systemic racism in this country. So I definitely think those things have had some impact. And then other things, you know, for mm -hmm. kids in school, it, you know, the disproportionate um, lack of access to broadband internet and technology has impacted minoritized kids at a much higher proportion than it has others in terms of having access to be to school and resources. So I, I definitely think that all of those things together have culminated in increasing distress for minoritized and disenfranchised populations. Yeah, in the context where everybody is distressed to begin with. And I think what you're talking some of what you're talking about is it doesn't mean that someone has a mental health condition, but where all our mental we all have mental health and our mental health is affected 
by what's going on around us. Now, some people who do have mental health conditions, this could exacerbate them or even uh, precipitate a condition that might not otherwise have appeared. And, and those people need more direct treatment. Um, we, you know, we funded a study that looked at suicide deaths in Maryland, and there was another similar study in Connecticut that showed that actually the rates of suicide, while the national rate seems to be declining a little bit, we, we're going to go with that. Um, it's not the same for whites and blacks. And in fact, the rate even of suicide has had an, an incremental increase while the rate for white people has declined. So we, we are all the same, but we're not experiencing the world the same and it's having an impact. I think that just highlights um, some of the, but the good news is these are things we can change. Um, right. The other thing I think that you're talking about is the uh, effect of stress and trauma across generations. You know, we know with many populations when there's been trauma in one generation, that's passed along. Um, I'm Jewish, you know, the trauma of the Holocaust passed along. I mean, I have very strong feelings about the Holocaust and what I might have lost and all that. So, and that was only one or two generations. You know, where, when you go back a couple, of, a few hundred years, that impact just keeps, unless something changes, that impact keeps having a, a, a compounding effect. So um, thank you for that answer. Um, Someone did ask whether or not how you could support AFSP, American Foundation for Su Suicide Prevention at the local grassroots level. Well, all our volunteers are all around the country. So I encourage you to go to AFSP.org and you can find your local chapter. And what we do just to, to be, you know, let you know about AFSP is that our mission is to save lives and bring hope. And we do that through research education advocacy and support for those who are affected by suicide. So there is something that everybody can do to help support suicide prevention with AFSP. Whether you walk in one of our out of the darkness walks that not only is a supportive and uplifting event, but also puts a face on suicide because let's face it, over half of us have actually lost somebody to suicide. Um, 12 million people in the U.S. have thought seriously about suicide, and over 47,000 people died by suicide in 2019. So we can do something. We can't prevent every suicide yet, um, and even if we can't, we can't prevent every heart attack and heart disease either, but we are making a difference, and we are making inroads, and I can tell you from the research, all the interventions that we have came out of research, and so they're, they're being tested. Um, so let's see another question. Have you found the mental health kids, mental health issues that kids and teens face sometimes have to do with the medical trials they're facing? In other words, the medical difficulties. What do you, what do you think about that? I think that's an excellent question. And so we, we do know that um, young people who have chronic medical conditions have higher rates of depression. Um, and we've known that for uh, years. And we try to provide for kids who have chronic conditions that will challenge them throughout their lives, such as diabetes, um, asthma, epilepsy. Um, we try to take a very proactive position in providing support for those families early so we can anticipate some of the challenges that may occur. Um, the, the, some of the adjustment difficulties really have to do with, you know, being different, you know, having something you have to do all the time to take care of yourself. Um, worries about your health, um, disruption to activities you'd normally be engaged with. Um, and if, it, if it's a condition that's associated with pain, um, the depression is significantly higher. So yeah, there are multiple adjustments that um, young people have to make when they're living with a chronic medical condition. Um, that being said, they don't all do poorly. Most of them do well. But it's important to recognize that for kids who have chronic conditions, um, you know, they're growing up surrounded by people who are healthy, you know, childhood and adolescence are the healthiest times of your lives. And if, if you don't fit into that group and you have to do things differently, that's that's a stressor. And then it's a stressor for parents, which is the other the other issue is that particularly for kids who have um, chronic recurring and relapsing um, episodes like cancer um, or sickle cell disease you know, where there will be periods where you'll have painful crises, um, no matter what you do. 
Um, and, you know, the, the best way to support kids who are struggling with those issues is recognize the challenges, um, maintain expectations similar to what you would do for your kids who don't have chronic conditions, but, you know, try to support them at the times that they're really struggling. But, I, you know, but we definitely do screen for more anxiety and depression among medical ill populations. So let's say you're a parent and you're worried about your child. Well, first of all, how would you know to be worried about your child? Um, you know, it, for kids with chronic medical conditions, it's or just, just in general, just you, you know, general. any kid, you're a parent. Yeah, so, so the biggest issue is change, right? So, I mean, parents know their kids and when your children start to act differently, um, you see changes in moods, increased conflict, um, decreased change in activities, not wanting to be hang out with their friends anymore that they used to hang out with, um, more isolation, um, less communicative, you know, um, hiding things, you know, those are the kind of things that we pay attention to. Um, but changes in mood, um, you know, are really important. If your kid's generally been a pretty outgoing, happy kid and you notice you see a change, you would ask anyway, and, and you should ask. Um, and you should ask, you should check in with kids about how they're doing anyway on a regular basis. But I think the biggest, the biggest change, the biggest issue becomes the changes. And I think that's what usually prompts most parents. Um, but a lot of times with teenagers, parents don't feel comfortable asking and they really should. So, so that, that's a question, you know, some people think if I ask my kid, which you wouldn't do right away, you know, you want to keep those doors open and have conversations. But, um, if you, if I say something about suicide or wanting to kill yourself, that I'm going to make them want that. What do you think about that? Does that happen? You know, <laughs> are you going to make somebody suicidal by asking them? So that's a big fear, right? Um, it's a fear a lot of people have. So no, I mean, it only makes people think about it if they're thinking about it. Um, and what's been shocking to me as a professional, even still now, um, if you ask kids, they tell you. So most kids aren't thinking about suicide. It's not, um, it's not a normal thing to think about. Um, I have to say, though, kids are exposed more than they used to be, right? So, you know, they they are aware that suicidality is out there. Um, sometimes they hear from their friends, but it it won't be the case that if you ask, have you been thinking about hurting yourself or killing yourself, or have you thought about suicide, if children know what that word means, um, it doesn't make them then think, well, maybe I wanna do that. It's just not what most kids think about. Now, if you ask most kids, they'll tell you they, they know about it or they know someone who may have done that, or they've heard about it, so they won't be shocked by the question, but it definitely won't make them think that they themselves should think about killing themselves. Yeah, and I think we've learned that asking someone who is thinking about it actually is a relief to them. Uh, it opens the door, and you don't have to suddenly become a mental health therapist, you know? All you have to do is have a conversation and help them get help, and help if it's not an emergency, which most of the time it's not, it means connecting them with a healthcare and mental health care professional. It doesn't mean you have to take them to the emergency room. As I said, 12 million people said they thought about suicide and 1.4 actually made an attempt. So there's a broad range in how people think about suicide. And so the most important thing is to have a conversation together so to, together you can figure out next steps you know do you need to go to the emergency room or can you just make an appointment with a mental health professional and if you're not comfortable with that start with your primary care clinician um there's just many ways to do that uh, what happens if you find out that your child is in that greater distress and they are thinking about it what do you do then you know well, well the first thing you do is talk to them I, I will say that i do ask every child um when i talk to schools about suicide to, to they don't have to tell me who it is think of one adult that you trust enough that you would tell if you were thinking about suicide or if someone else was thinking about suicide because kids frequently say don't tell anybody right um and so you know so i just want to call that out because i think that's really important um, but if your kid is saying to you that I'm thinking about, I've been, I have thought about suicide, I've thought about hurting myself, it's important that you ask and listen. Um, they need to know that as adults, you're strong enough to handle it um, and that you can handle the problem and you can help them with it. And, and then I would, you should seek, you should seek professional help. And if that, if you're worried about, you know, sometimes I tell parents, even if you 
you're not sure, but you're worried something could happen now, call the emergency department and go there. Okay, yeah. uh, you know the, the only thing it costs you is your time, uh, but you'll but it'll save you time in the in the end because you'll be able to sleep safely. Um, the other thing is that you know tell your primary care doctor, you know tell a professional. It doesn't have to be a mental health professional, but you know let someone know that this has come up and you're not sure what to do and that you're seeking help, and they'll connect you with um, someone who actually can help you. So I think yes. that's really important. Don't it be. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. You're not alone with it and uh, you don't have to be alone with it. In fact, we have also um, at, on our website and we'll share the resources. We have a great section for parents and we also have guides for how to have a conversation. And then finally, we have this fantastic um, uh, yes, public survey, service campaign, sorry. Um, we have this great public service campaign with the Jed Foundation and the Ad Council called Seize the Awkward. We'll put that in too. And it's, it has tools for kids, you know, teenagers and young adults, but parents can use them also uh, for how to have conversations, how to know when you should have that conversation. Uh, and we have videos showing how to have that conversation. And, and by the way, it's really funny and cute. There are posters for your school or your room. So check out seizetheawkward.org um, because there's lots of information there. Kids will talk to you if you start that conversation, but if they won't talk to you, there's probably somebody else they'll talk to. So find out who that person is. It's it's not it, it doesn't have to be a blow to you. It's it's not doesn't have to be that you're not you know <laughs> you're you're not doing enough. It just mean may mean that you're their parent. <laughs> and they want to talk to somebody who's not involved in the situation. School counselors are another group to talk to. Tammy, you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that I, you know, it seems like I heard recently that with the launch of the text line, um, that a lot of, you know, with the helpline, a lot of kids have used the text. And, um, and it, interestingly, um, one of the things that I've heard recently is that the largest number of individuals to use the text line has been um, teenagers. And so I think that, you know, I thought that's really quite promising, um, you know, um, that people are willing to reach out. And, you know, we're finding that young people are much more willing to use technology. <laughs> they'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, really. What a surprise. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but they'll let you know that they need help. They'll text for help. I just thought that's incredible. We, we you know, we have to use that to, to get the word out, but also to be able to respond when folks are, are distressed. Yeah, so the crisis text line, you can text TALK to 741-741, and they can have a conversation. Also, with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255, if you're a family member and you're worried about someone who's in a, a crisis, then um, you can call them, and they will guide you as to what you might do and also where you could find local help. So um, I think also, you know, take take note of your kids' social media, you know, discussions. Um, don't be afraid of social media because it turns out that the majority of things on social media are actually very helpful. And so kids are often, te you know, looking at how do I help my friend or what do I do if I'm depressed? And there are some great websites and, um, but there are some, some web, some, you know, sites where they do talk about suicide and are really negative for people. And sometimes when somebody is suicidal, they're looking at those sites because some because they're looking for some way to kill themselves, but more often because they feel understood at those sites. They feel like I'm not alone. Somebody else feels like I do. But I want to emphasize what you just said, though, about using the text line, the crisis lines, because, you know, to the question of what do you do when your kid's saying, I'm thinking about harming myself or killing myself, you know, for some families, the whole idea of making the phone call to any professional is alarming or, it, you know, that becomes the barrier. But I, I would strongly encourage people to use the crisis line. And just like you said, to ask the question, like, I, I just had this happen. I don't know what to do. Um, can you help me? Um, I, I think is a good use of the crisis line. And it, it, you know, people will guide, will respond and guide you through what you need to do next. You know, I think the hardest thing when you're a parent and your kid is in distress is to not try and fix it. 
to not try and tell them what to do or, oh, don't worry about it, just stop, it'll go away, you'll feel better. Um, because in that moment, their thinking has changed. You know, They have a negative lens on, they, they're looking short term. This is what we've learned from research by studying the brains and behavior of kids and adults who have made suicide attempts or thought about suicide, that they don't have access to their usual coping capacity. So the kid you know who always does so great, or maybe they've ne never done great, um, they can't just snap out of it. And so as a parent, you know, we have to try to be non-judgmental. Like, what are you, crazy? No, that's not going to be helpful to them. It, you know, saying, I'm so sorry, this must be really difficult. I'm here with you. I hear what you're saying, and we're going to help you. We're going to help you get help. And I know it doesn't feel like it now, but you are going to if we keep working on it and we don't ignore it, we, I really have every reason to think you will feel better, but I understand that right now you feel miserable. Um, you know, we wanna solve it, you know, we'll call your friends or you know, go out and play basketball, whatever, go pray, whatever it is that you would tell them, that's not how their brain is functioning in that moment. Well, that, that's true. And you know, one of the other things I wanted to mention is that you know, during the pandemic, um, we're seeing more and more younger children um, coming to the emergency department, um, saying that they have been thinking about killing themselves. Their parents are bringing them in because their child has expressed that to them. And, you know, and some of the questions that come up is like, is it even possible for a six-year-old to be thinking about suicide? And, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, kids that age certainly do understand the concept of death. Um, but most of the time, their their wish is not to be dead. It's just not to be experiencing whatever they're experiencing. But it's important to ask because they they can think of ways to do it, right? They they do it. So it, and it's easy, right? They run into traffic, which is what kids most commonly say they're going to do. Um, and but I think it's it's when young people, young children are telling you that a lot of adults tend to ignore that and say, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. But it's just not normal for children to say, I don't want to be here anymore. Um, and it's really important that when that happens, you respond. Yeah, I think that, you know, highlighting that is, you know, there's this sense that, you know, teenagers and kids are at high risk for suicide and every, you know, everyone's on the verge, but actually it's not true. And, and I want to highlight what you said, which is, so when you hear someone talking about and they may not say, I want to kill myself or hurt myself or whatever. They may just say, you know, I'm just too tired. I don't want to be here anymore. You won't miss me. You know, soon you won't have to deal with this. There are sometimes subtle statements. So it really involves listening to your kids and trying to get a sense of the feeling they're trying to get across. Because honestly, they often don't say that unless you ask them, and that's why we have to ask them. But if you don't ask them, they're, they're probably going to talk about being hopeless or being in pain or feeling like nobody understands. And so we have to listen and use that to have that conversation. And we don't want to wait for kids to be suicidal. If your kid is in distress, even if they're hopefully not thinking of taking their life, yeah, it still requires action. Yeah, and I was going to say, Joe, you know, one of the things that um, has been, you know, one of the things I think about as I think about suicide with children, you know, I think even though suicides are a rare event, okay, I mean, completed suicides are a rare event, um, you know, the reality is that for children, children don't die of many things anymore. So, you know, the reality is that all the things that used to cause death for children, with the exception of accidents, um, we've found ways to treat them. And so we've even found cures for some cancers. When I was a medical student, cancer was a, a death sentence right. for cancers for children. And now we have cures for them. So, you know, even though suicide is a rare event for kids, um, there's not many things except for motor vehicle accidents that kill more children than suicide. Um, and then any single suicide is a tragedy. We, we know that because it's a life lost and you can, you, you can never recover that. But I, I do just want to put it in some context. You know, the reason it's so important is that children live through almost everything now with their chronic illnesses. Um, you know, sickle cell disease used to be a fatal disease by the time you were in your teens. 
I now have patients in their 50s with sickle cell disease. And so, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of highlight that as we're thinking about children suicide, that that actually increases, that actually really adds to the tragedy of, of such an event. Yeah, and I, I think you're also touching on the reason why you always hear suicide is the second leading cause of death for kids, because they fortunately don't usually die. Um, but like you said, one, one loss of one child is too many, and um, we can at least try to prevent it. Now, what, what if you're a parent who did lose someone to suicide? I'm sorry, I'm sorry that again. What if you're a parent who did lose someone to suicide? What, like, how do you, how do you go on after that? You know, yeah, it's, you know, so that's a question that I don't, I, you know, I have to say, honestly, I have lots of ideas, but I just think it's such a horrible experience that it would be hard to advise anyone, but, you know, but people do go on. And, yeah. and, you know, and so, uh, you know, recognizing the grief, um, getting the support that you need, um, you know, many people find their families and their churches and their community supportive, and many people need more than that because it's a long-term process. It's not... I mean, it's a grief you will probably experience for the remainder of your life. Um, and some people have found, um, actually, when I when I started, when I became involved with with AFSP, the person who helped me become involved with AFSP was someone who had lost a child to suicide. And so the way she coped with it was by trying to build something that would keep her child alive. And so I think that all of us have different ways of coping with things, but recognize it is probably the most losing your child will be the most significant loss that you have and seeking the support and the help that you need to be able to address that. And then AFSP also has resources for so suicide survivors, right? So, you know, I, I would really would encourage you to go to the website and to reach out. I um, even if it means calling your local AFSP, which, which is what I did when I was struggling with you know, how to support kids in our city who were dying of suicide. I called AFSP and um, and I had help immediately because yeah. someone actually answered the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Not a machine? <laughs> no, a real Kathy, person? <laughs> Kathy Siciliano answered the phone. Yes. And, and we still do that. I'm joking. We don't, ha we, we don't have machines. We're our boots on the ground. You yes. know? Um, we have an amazing field staff and again, amazing chapters, volunteers. And we have a great program called Healing Conversations, which uh, because it is a process of healing. And, and I think you're right. You know, the, it's never going to be OK that that happened. But people find there's something called post-traumatic growth. And even though that sadness will be there and it'll crop up in the weirdest places at the weirdest times, um, People do find ways and, and new ways to engage in life. And suicide prevention is obviously one of them. So one of the programs we have is called Healing Conversations. So for anybody, if you've lost someone to suicide, you will be matched with, as best we can with somebody who else who has been in a similar, had a similar loss, maybe a child. And um, you can have a conversation with them about whatever about how you're feeling you what to expect how did they get to where they are because all our volunteers are, are doing that and they're actually trained to have those conversations and they're far enough out in time and healing that they can share their experience with you the other thing is that we do have um access on our sites we train people to run suicide support groups, survivor support groups, and we list them. You can find them on our website. We have a list for you to look up. So we have a whole section of I've lost someone to suicide and it's very helpful because you're, you're not alone. But the healing is a process. It's, it, and it's a slow process and every, everybody's process is, is different. We also have the International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day, which is always the Saturday before uh, Thanksgiving although we have some uh, adapted. We, we had one in Spanish last year. I think we'll be doing that again. Um, we have online. Um, so just check out International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day, and you can connect on that day. You can register and connect. So uh, things are challenging with COVID. You know, um, our events were not live last year, but they still happened. And um, the other thing that happens with suicide loss is, you know, we have to understand that not everybody's comfortable with it. 
you know, honestly, not everybody's comfortable with death. And so no matter how a person dies, some people get closer and some people run away. Um, so educating people about how to help a person who's lost someone to suicide is really important. Um, but the more you can talk about it and share it, and the research has shown that if you do tell your story um, and you do have conversations, that you're more likely to eventually experience post-traumatic growth. And that's the thing that keeps us going, right? We're always growing and changing and trying to be productive, you know? <laughs> so um, we only have a couple of more minutes. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering if you have any, you know, we're talking particularly about um, minority youth and black youth. What should we keep in mind when working with kids from those groups? You know, I, I think in general, um, you know, as we're look, as we're really starting to look at what's different about suicide in Black kids, because um, it's diff it is different. Um, you know, sometimes it's the same things that upset other kids, but you know, what we are, what the research is starting to show pretty clearly is the experience of racial discrimination um, is actually linked to suicide in, in in Black kids, particularly if they don't have a strong racial identification or strong ethnic strong positive ethnic identification. But I do also know that, you know, kids will tell you, but I do think it's important that um, for therapists, you know, and for professionals working with black kids who happen to not be black themselves because that changes the dynamic is that you have to get comfortable talking about race and creating an environment where, um, where they know it's comfortable to be able to talk about the experiences they're having because if you're not able to accomplish that, it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy to have them talk about their experiences of mental health challenges or suicide or depression or all the kind of things that you have to address. Um, it, it, in some ways, there's um, some data that suggests that, you know, being racially or ethnically concordant makes that, makes that easier. So if you're the same race or ethnic background as your patient, there, there's definitely some benefits to that. But given that that's not how the U.S. is shaped and that's not who we are, um, it's important that people who are not the same have some cultural humility, um, recognize that you need to learn about others and get comfortable talking about race you know, and racism and racist experiences without personalizing them and using that information to help you connect more with your patient. Thank you so much, Dr. Benton. You've been so helpful. Thank you to our audience. We appreciate your questions and we just appreciate you being here. So if you want any additional information about AFSP, come to AFSP.org and also check out all our events that are happening all the time. Um, so thank you, be well, and um, I'll see you again soon. Thank you, bye.